the question can line up in the center. We'll kind of just go in order. You guys can uh, kind of project your voice with the questions, and then you guys can share that mic. This one's a little weak, so I'm going to use okay. this one. And then you guys can share that mic for answering the questions. So if that, that sounds good, then... Uh, Everybody gonna, gets an A. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets an A. Everybody gets an A. So, first of all, I want to thank you both for coming. This is really exciting to have Thanks you here. We're, we're super excited. This is our first time doing this in this area, so having uh, some great guests for our first event is really exciting for us. So, but um, yeah, so if you guys aren't as familiar with their work, you know, uh, I'd say a multitude of voice acting roles for anime, shows, video games. I mean, you guys have a lot of stuff under both of your belts, and uh, that is kind of one of the reasons why we're so excited to have you here. So, um, I think I wanted to start off with just like, each of you one at a time giving a little background of how you got into doing voice acting specifically since that's you know a different type of acting and you know very unique in its own right. Um, I uh, got into um, just acting because I think most of us started out just being actors and not just setting out to be a voice actor. Um, my initial goal was to be on Barney when I was five. Um, and that led to uh, harassing my parents to let me take acting classes because they said it's a very hard industry, you're not gonna like it. Um, but I kept just any difficult task they gave me, I loved it even more. And then I ended up meeting with an agent. My mom was like, this will be a terrible experience for her and then it'll shut it down. And she was wrong, I got an agent. And um, that agent, the kid department, was talking to the adult agent, and they sent me in for a voiceover audition. They needed a, the voice of a three-year-old to say a bunch of big words for um, a 7-Eleven campaign, all these elaborate ways that Slurpees and donuts were made. And um, I was eight years old, and um, I sounded like a three-year-old, I guess, and I got the job. <laughs> and so that was how I got into voiceover and voice acting. And now you sound like a 13-year-old. And now <laughs> I sound like a 13-year-old, and I still can say three. those words. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I'm a little different. <laughs> um, I loved acting. I think um, as a as a kid, but like I would sing like in the shower <laughs> or while I was taking out the trash. Um, I was a math uh, and science geek. Um, I was a scholarship kid, and I worked my way through a lot of schools by being the tutor or helping people with SATs. And um, I loved music. I loved acting. I got a degree um, in theater, and promptly. Um, work with disaster relief and doing everything except theater. I mean, I just felt like I was going to be a professional dodgeball player. It was much more likely than being in the tech industry. And then I ended up working as a, a bank analyst um, for a Wall Street mortgage firm. And I took a class. And people said I had a really good voice. And um, there was a weekend, like, sampler class. Like, it's not going anywhere, but I wanted to learn about voiceover, and, and the teacher taught an audiobook one weekend, commercials the next, animation the next, cool. so I mean, it was really quick. And there was uh, an agent's night at the end. And I mean, every now and then, we're all eight-year-olds, and anything's possible. We could open up a chocolate bar and get the golden ticket, right? <laughs> so in the back of my mind, I was like, I could get discovered, and then I did. Cool. And so I got signed. And the one thing that was preventing me from being a professional voice actress was me. I, I couldn't go and tell my parents, now that I've made $5,000, that forget going to law school. It just didn't seem plausible. And then uh, there was a banking crash, and my, my backup job of anime and gaming ended up being my only job. Um, well, that's not true. It, it was a job alongside working for Valet of the Dolls, <laughs> parking <laughs> cars, <laughs> and, and Malibu Maid Service, because it was $20 an hour, and serving food. Until then, like a couple yeah. of years later, it was just fully voice acting. Sure. And I kept thinking I was still going to go to law school. You know? So again, I was the one who was saying it was impossible. And four years ago, I was in a car accident. Someone was texting and driving, and they broke my back. Oh, and I was temporarily paralyzed and people from Bang Zoom and a couple other studios were there when I woke up and they arranged all of my sessions for the next few months to be in handicap accessible places. Wow. Awesome. And it was like being, it's a wonderful life, one of my favorite films, but I felt like I was ha seeing how much of an effect I had on people and how they wanted to be there for me and what an amazing job I had that the kind of engineers and directors and uh, everyone was there for me 
why would I want to go to law school? <laughs> <laughs> law school will always yeah, be. Yeah, right? I was like, I could be a nine-year-old lawyer. I'll go, I'll go with you. Right? We'll do law school together. And I was like, it suddenly hit me that the only person that didn't think I was going to be a professional voice actress was me. I mean, I had full ride insurance. I was at the Cedar sinai Spine Center, got great you know, care. But as I was getting better, um, here's my geek side, guys. Uh, neuroplasticity is like a big thing for me. I've been studying that for the brain, and and you know, as as I had come into my own physical therapy, they say even when you can't move your body, they'll make you do your repetitions for the rest of your physical therapy just in your brain, and it starts to reopen your nerves and synapses. And so, for once, I was able to stand again and walk. Here I am doing games, and I'm imagining myself as you know Jade or Lifeline, and I'm like these really badass characters who are fully functional. And it and it was as if I was reprogramming this body to become you know vital and alive. And so gaming it literally has saved my life and created a new world for me. Like my avatars have taught me you know, what to expect more. And I've decided not to go to law school, and I think I'm gonna be a voice actress, you know, Yay. for a while. <laughs> but just letting you guys know your, your passion, your dream will find time for you. And I am the patron saint of late bloomers. So uh, you don't have to be 16 and know what, what it, where it's at. You could be in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, there's always more. I mean, if you're still breathing, we've still got a little bit of hope. That's right. Well, that's very, <laughs> that's uh, my hashtag. <laughs> very inspirational, and it's exciting because that's like it's it's really cool to hear how you guys both got to where you are, you know, to this point. So, uh, actually, uh, Mela, I'll ask you uh, because you mentioned the gaming side of things kind of being an important thing. Um, do you notice that there's like a difference between doing like a traditional voice role for like a show or a part like that, and then doing something like the quips and the one-liners where people, they're coming for people's actions and stuff. And especially with something like Apex Legends, like, you know, they're kind of like sassy and things like that. So is there, what is the difference between that and do you have like a preference of what you like to do? Um, I love voice acting, period. Um, it is a director's medium, whether it's animation, anime, or gaming. Um, a lot of times we don't see the big picture. So when you start to have trust in your directors and, and, and the story writing, for Jade, the same thing. I, I auditioned for Guard A. It was so top secret. And so they just really want you to be yourself. And so I imagine myself as like, you seem confident. Well, now you seem overconfident. And so she had this kind of swagger, and I felt like she was, but she was Guard A. I didn't know until I walked into Warner Brothers that she was just... <laughs> 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 but um, I think that the difference is still acting and still trust with your director. Um, for me, I'm a story mode girl. I really like story mode. Um, but then when we go back to my recovery, when you're playing Jade or, or Lifeline, she's got such swagger. She's funny. She's loving. But like she heals you. Um, I think it was really instrumental in the past two years for me to have a body and to be reprogramming myself. And so you get a chance to imagine yourself really 10 steps above who you are now. And I think that's where gaming is so powerful, whether it's bending our concepts of diversity or normal, um, you start to think outside the box and, and get to be your greatest self in an alternate universe. And I think it does bleed into this universe um, very successfully. So I love animation. I love uh, you know anime right now. Games have my heart. <laughs> it's just really exciting to drive onto the Warner Brothers lot and see like the water tower and just be like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Well, and I mean, then you, you're like a Disney girl. So you're I'm, living every day. I'm all of the above. I like, I, I like, I was, someone asked like, what is it like working for Nintendo, or what is it like working for uh, fill in the blank, whatever company? And yeah, it's really cool to get to work on the projects we get to work on. But half the time when we're going to work, we have no idea what we're working on. We get a code name. Um, we just know a lot of times the companies that we're working on uh, or that we're working with. And so when you look at, wow, this is the timesheet I'm filling out, and this is who the company is. This is so surreal. I grew up knowing this legendary brand, and now I get to say, 
I got to work with this legendary brand that never gets old. It never gets old getting to it's swipe my sheet. No, it never gets old getting to swipe my card to go into the Disney uh, into the Disney parking structure. It never, yeah, it, comes. it never gets old driving out of the Warner Brothers lot, like she said, the water tower. I take a selfie every single time I'm there. Um, anytime there's an audition, and I could just be auditioning for a, a one-line character on a TV show. Anytime I get to walk on the lot and I get my little pass, I save all of them. They like stay in my car until they start to turn yellow, and then I keep them. Uh, because I, I, like she said, we love this industry. We're absolute nerds for everything in this industry. And so when you guys say, oh, it'd be so cool to get to walk in the lot, I guess you get tired of that. We never get tired of that, ever, ever. It's magical every single time. When I go into the Disney lot to go like get my iPod, my, my iPad looked at or my, my phone looked at, um, I'm like, man, Walt Disney used to like walk here. They, they created Mary Poppins here. I'm like breathing this magical air. <laughs> and then I'm like, please fix my laptop. Yeah. But this is magical. <laughs> yeah, it's magical. That's exciting. So, uh, Charmy, you've done a lot of anime voice work a lot. Uh, and uh, I wanted to know, because there's such a wide variety in anime, is there any like specific scripts that you've gotten that maybe like surprised you? Like, oh wow, this role is like, you know, something I didn't expect it to be. Or, uh, and then kind of going off of that, is there like a favorite role that you've done that just has been like really special and close to your heart? Um, well, I started doing anime uh, when I was 18, 17 or 18, like right, right before I turned 18, when I graduated from high school and went, signed up for college and was like, well, I guess I don't get to be an actor anymore because I was going to school full time and then I would like leave during lunch and go to voiceover commercials or be gone for a week and shoot an episode of fill in the blank, whatever came up. But I was like, well, now it's time to grow up and I guess I'm not going to get to be an actor full time. And then my first week of college, I had an audition at Funimation. I was like, man, it'd be pretty cool if I got to do this. And I booked um, a lead in the show called Peach Girl. I had no idea that it was anime because my experience with anime was Dragon Ball, Pokemon, Sailor Moon. That's what I thought anime was. And so I remember working on the show and I was like, so what are we actually doing? Because I mean, it looks kind of like anime, but obviously it's not, because it's not Dragon Ball, Pokemon, or Sailor Moon. <laughs> and I remember the director was like, no, it's, it's anime. I was like, oh, cool. So we worked on the show, we're working on it for a couple months, and he said, we're gonna fly you to Anime Boston, we need you to sign autographs and uh, promote the show. And I said, why would anyone want my autograph? They don't know, I, the show isn't out yet. I don't understand. They're like, no, people know about this show. It's been out in Japan. Okay, but well, why would anybody want my autograph if it's already been out in Japan? And they're like, no, it, it's gonna be fine. I was like, so I go to Anime Boston. It's my first experience in an anime convention. Went with my mom, since still 17. And uh, I like remember going, going downstairs to the lobby and seeing all these people cosplaying, going, "What is this magical world? What is?" And the whole I remember the first day walking around in the vendors hall, I was like, "This is anime. This is anime." It was like Nightmare Before Christmas. What's this? What's this? Like, I was like, so all of this is anime? Um, and I remember going back after that weekend. And everybody was so lovely and so supportive of the show. Um, and I was like, you guys, I don't know. I don't know if you knew, director of animation who's done a million things. There are lots of anime shows. Like, so many. You should do more of them. They're like, oh, come with us. And they took me down the hallway and introduced me to the other directors. And there were like six studios at the time. Now I think there's like 12. And they're working like 12 hours a day. At this point, there were six studios. And uh, they were like, she just understands what's happening. And so then after that, I was working at like five shows at the same time. And uh, I was like, wow, this is crazy. I could be doing this like all the time for my job. And I remember doing an industrial for Pure One um, around that time. And Laura Bailey was playing the manager. And she goes, so you need to be working for this company that I work for. We do a lot of uh, cartoons and animation. And I was like, cool, I just started working at a place like that. If there's another one, that would be amazing. 
Little did I know Laura had told like the producer, one of the head producers at Funimation, you've got to meet this girl, share me. And they said, we're already working with her, Laura. And so I got now in trouble with Laura for like not knowing who I was working for, but we had no idea. But I was like, well, thanks, Laura, for like putting in a good word. And then when I moved to LA, she put in a good word again to get me working in another studio. So like she said, the yes, it's been amazing getting to work on for anime and to know that it's such a, a huge world. I never thought I would be playing characters that uh, are great with swords and are <laughs> super in, in, in incredible fighters and these really strong, powerful women. The one time I held a katana, I almost cut my thumb off. So like, <laughs> clearly, it's not my uh, strong suit yet. But I wouldn't have imagined that I would be capable of doing those things if somebody didn't say, yeah, you can do these fighting reactions. You're strong enough. You sound cool. You can do these things. Um, because my experience as an actor was I would only get cast for what I looked like. And in voiceover, it doesn't matter what you look like. It's what you believe you can sound like and what your voice can emulate. And like she said, if you don't believe you can do it, you're not going to get the job. So you might as well try to find that in yourself. What is what does strength look like for you? What does a warrior look like for you? And how does that come out of your soul through your voice? Um, and anime is all about doing that, which is fantastic. So it's really hard to pick a favorite because they've all come to my life at moments where I needed them. When I worked on Sword Art Online, it was the first time that I was um, dealing with uh, the death of a loved one. And so I learned how to process grief as Asuna was processing grief. And we did that at the same time. And I've had one of those like perfectly uh, serendipitous moments with every single one of my characters. So picking a favorite is way too hard. Also, like I said, a lot of them are really good fighters, and they all like live in my head, so to upset one of them, be like, oh, I'm not the favorite? Don't set them off. Yeah, I don't want to have that no, sort that, of pressure. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear that. I mean, that's, it sounds like the surprise of what you had in store for you ended up just making the whole no category idea. a favorite. Yeah, I, 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 I have no idea. I mean, me if somebody told me, me like, when I was in high school or when I was a kid, uh, you're gonna be doing a lot of work, just your voice, and people are gonna want you to travel all over the world, and people are gonna care that you're there and wanna meet you, I would've been like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, but like, wow. you guys are here sitting in a panel, and you wanna hang out with us, and this is incredible and like, super Amazing. surreal, and it never, I, I mean, I've been going to conventions for over 10 years, and I, it never gets old, it never gets less magical. I never walk around and go like, oh, cosplay, who cares? I'm still like, look at them, they look amazing. What is this thing? Is this anime too? This is so cool. Yeah, so, and the community is so supportive. Yeah. Not just the fans and the attendees and conventions, but like the voice actors are yeah. so supportive of each yeah. other. We're all competing Definitely. for the same role, but we're still like, yeah, you had that. You had to be this character. Yeah. We all want to support the game. We all want to buy it. We all want to wear our friends' merch. Like, it's and not like that. The struggle, so it's like, you know, when you see somebody succeeding, I'm sure it's just motivating yeah. you and also encouraging just to see that it's like, we're helping yeah. them. So. Yeah, you don't want to live in the mentality of lack. Yeah. yeah. You go, and that way, if you live in the mentality of lack, there will be lack, always. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of uh, feeling good about each other, I just want to say Erica Lindbeck's one of my besties. Uh, Futaba, I see you back there. I took a picture and I sent it to her. I was like, thinking of you. She, she texted me back. She's like, oh, I've been replaced. Oh, shoot. She's like, man. Yes. Yes. Well, speaking of the fans, uh, why don't we open up the floor? Yeah. If anybody has any questions, uh, you know, feel free to voice them, and we can continue the panel from there until we run out of time. Oh. <laughs> this is a Q and A. <laughs> he gets an A, he's got to have some Qs. Yes. What was your very first? Is it voiceover or character? Yeah. Voiceover job. Yeah, yeah. What, what was your very first? Do you remember your very first? Mm. Um, my first, my first jobs. I don't think it's on anymore. Can I turn off? You can still hear me, right? Yes. Um, my first jobs uh, in voiceover were audiobook. Oh, uh, my mom is British, and I had that clear scarlet letter, that kind of voice. I was the kid at twelve who, when my mom got a divorce, and I was like, "Hello." Some guy would be like, hey, kitten. And I was like, oh. I was like, who is this? And he'd be like, you know, grrr. <laughs> I was like, um, I think I need to get my 
my mother. <laughs> and then there'd be like dead silence. I was like a really old child. That's so awesome. when I first got here, um, I did some audiobook, but then um, I had a commercial agent for a second. My, my boyfriend at the time was sort of famous, and they were kind of hip pocketing me, which means that they were representing you, but like the odds of you getting called are zero. So there was something called Vampire Princess Miu, and um, they wanted someone who had like a sultry, you know, dark vampire voice. I was like, that's so me. But I was so excited. And I was like, I just want to thank you guys so much for, for calling me. And it was like this squeaky, weird voice. And they're like, you're really not right for this. They didn't even let me read for it. No way. And so they said, can you read something else? And it was like some excited person. She's like, I hate you so much. Like, seriously, why do you even? And they're like, yeah, thanks. And so I go to the car and I call the manager. I'm really embarrassed because it's my first like audition in Hollywood. Yeah. And he goes, I can't talk to you right now. They've called me. They want you to be the lead in some other show. I'll call you back. Oh. <laughs> and it was St. Tale. And it was like, Aww. so a million years ago, I was like too young to understand what was happening. And I'd never done anime. And um, Steve Kramer was the director. So he, he taught me as we were going how to do it. And I'm like her. Like, I, I was grateful for the job. And they had free snacks. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't like I was going to quit my day job. Um, and then I like shoot forward eight years, um, and I am at a comic con, and um, I'm thinking. First of all, my first major convention was Comic Con San Diego. Yeah. Oh my god. Then like the major. And it was <laughs> two male actors, and I in my brain, I'm in the show with them. I'm like, well, they must have needed a girl, like to balance it out, right? So I'm nervous, but they're doing all this camera stuff, and I'm in the middle, and I'm like, like this. <laughs> so my friend Walter is the Black Power Ranger, and I see him, and he walks up to me, and, and we're at this like arc table. They, they walked us through a bunch of hallways and down at this, and there's a lot of people, and then we just sat down, and I guess I was just really focused on, I don't know, some signing autographs and just thinking, this is so cool, right? And Walter's like, why didn't you tell me that you were in Vampire Night? And I was like, well, because you're a dude, and I'm pretty sure you don't watch girl anime. And he's like, there's nothing girl about that. <laughs> and then he's like, he flips over the bag, and they always put characters on the Comic-Con bags, mm -hmm. like the featured, there's like four special collector bags, and there was Yuki Cross on the bag. And, and I, I was like, well, what is she doing on your bag? Did you buy a bag? He's like, no, she's a big character. And I was like, no, she's not. And he goes, turn around. And there was this little tiny camera on like a tripod in front of us. And I thought it was for archive purposes or something. And I turned around and there's a jumbotron of uh, this, this actor and this actor and me. And I'm like, thank God I don't pick my nose. Like, you know, <laughs> because like anything could have happened there. Like, I was like, oh my gosh. And there's a line out the door. And I'm like, so people watch anime. I mean, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, free snacks. I didn't get to watch TV as a kid. Like, it was none of this. And then somebody had emailed me. I thought it was a joke. They were like, hey, well, you know, I, I didn't even have a website at that time. I was starting a band, and I had gotten like a record, like a publishing deal on like some weird whim. And he emails me, and the guy says, um, I see that you have a band. Uh, we need someone to play our masquerade ball and perform in Sydney, Melbourne, New Zealand, Auckland. Could we pay for you and your band to come out? I'm like, yeah, I'm Nicaraguan okay, Prince. Sure. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't know what's okay. happening. But it was another Comic Con. And so I spent that year like flying around the world because of anime. Yeah. And that's when it started kind of sneaking up. It was like another three years till the accident where I was like, all right, like the universe was literally like, had to be in a car accident to wake me up. Yeah. But I, I was, it was so much fun and, and not to, to, to say that meeting you guys is not like the most amazing thing in the world, but the job before I knew that we would get to meet you and hang out with you, uh, it was so great. Yeah. The people were so great. It's like you get to go to recess for work. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and so it's just, it was stunning and 
beautiful and now and the rest of it's just been like a chocolate river you know like I'm, I'm a big raw doll fan by the way <laughs> so I feel like you know some people are like well whatever chocolate river and I was just like what you can eat these <laughs> and that's what the the career is like and you guys just I was that kid who moved every six months when I was growing up so I was at the lunch table by myself and so it's like I have this whole new childhood, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And we all get to eat together, and I get to know everybody. Long answer to your question. <laughs> that was the first, you know, kind of job. But you don't really think of it as a job. Yeah. You're, I, I think I wasn't as young as you when I started. It's the same thing. We're just kind of floating, and it's like this is cool. Yeah. Uh, you're just happy to be there, but you're not quite aware of where you're at until somebody like pulls back the curtain, and there's like a hundred thousand yeah. people at a coffee shop. Yeah. I mean, I, my first, I know my first job for voiceover, um, I was eight and it was a campaign for 7-Eleven and we did like four oh. spots. And, um, and then uh, because I was a kid who knew what it was like to be in a booth and they knew that I wasn't gonna freeze up or be weird, I was doing voiceover commercials every week, a couple times a week and I would just leave during lunch and then go record these commercials and go back to school and my parents had a rule that if I got uh, like a B, like a low B, like I had to quit. And I was like, I will not. So I would stay up late to make sure I got my homework done and make sure everything was all set. Um, and then I was working at Radio Disney. I was doing all the promos for them, which I thought was really cool when I was eight years old. I got $8 an hour. And that was, that was my money. Like that, that, the rest of the money went into like my banking account. Um, and it would like pay for headshots or classes or things like that. Uh, but the $8 an hour and we'd go in for a one hour session, I was like, I get $8 a week. I'm, I'm a working actor. And, um, and I felt, I felt, I remember at eight years old feeling like I have a job. Um, but let's be real, it wasn't a job. Uh, I mean, it was, but it was it was very exciting. And then, so that was my first like voiceover job. But I remember I was doing a bunch of auditions and doing uh, film and TV stuff when it came up. And then I got to audition for my very first cartoon, and I was nine. And I had auditioned for some other uh, uh, like sort of cartoons before then, and um, hadn't gotten cast. And so I was getting my first taste of rejection. Um, and uh, I had auditioned for this movie and it was down to me and another girl and there were going to be puppets in the movie and they flew me to Nashville and I met with the producers and I was like, this is going to be so cool, I'm going to be in this movie with all these puppets, it's going to be amazing. And then they called and told my agent, like, we loved her, she was our choice, but once we saw her in person, she's really, really little. She was shorter than the puppets, so we're actually going with the other choice. And I remember crying in my room and my mom said, you can cry for one hour to get it out of your system because I will not let this business ruin my child. This is what, you, if you're gonna be like this and it's gonna eat you alive, you cannot do this because you cannot let this destroy you. And so I was so heartbroken, I cried and I remember saying to her, you don't understand how much this hurts. And she said, I do understand how much this hurts. And that's why in an hour, we're gonna go do something else. We're gonna go to the dollar store and we're gonna get a craft and we're gonna take your mind off of it, but you have one hour to grieve this role. This will not be the last time. And it's not the last time. And yeah, there are some times where I take way more than an hour to grieve the role. Um, but I remember the next week I auditioned for this cartoon uh, to play a hummingbird. And I had to talk really quick as this hummingbird. And I remember, like she said, being so nervous that I like went in and I was like, Oh, they showed me the cartoon. It's this cute little hummingbird named Eve, and it was at the building where they filmed Barney, same production <laughs> company where Barney was filmed. I'm like walking through, I'm like freaking out. So I go in to stand behind the mic and uh, talked so fast, you could not understand anything. And uh, I remember they said, we didn't know it was possible for a child to talk that fast. <laughs> and I was like, was that fast? And they were like, Yes. <laughs> and my response was, I can do it faster. And they were like, okay. Uh, and so like, it was this fun, like how many words can I say and how fast can I do it? And I was so nervous, I was so amped up. They called my agent uh, right afterwards, like uh, I got into the car and this never happens. It took like 20 minutes to walk out, get in the car. And my mom has a, a pager and she gets an emergency page. 
and uh, we had to go find a phone. And uh, she said they called Jeremy immediately, and she booked the job. How fast was she talking? <laughs> and, um, so my very first like cartoon voiceover role, like a character, not like car uh, commercials and things, uh, was a hummingbird named Eve. And I guess I got the job just for talking too fast. <laughs> I'll take it. But I got to work at the company where Barney was made, yeah. and I got to work for the like a, a like year earlier. I had worked for the company where. Uh, worked for the producer and the director of Barney. I never got to be on Barney. So close. I was so close. I, I, when I worked with the director on my ninth birthday, I was like, I'm going to go meet with them. And they said, We're, we want to talk to you. I was like, it's well, <laughs> we live in a world of reboots, and maybe the Barney reboots uh, over the horizon. As I said, Barney's going to be on an app now. If the kids like log into the app, well, and like Barney shows up, it'd be great. It will be the. Uh, I want to. I'll direct an episode yeah, or something. I mean, you got to be involved somehow. Yeah, that'd be pretty great. Aww. But they told me like we think Barney, you being on Barney would ruin your career. Like, so that's why. But nine-year-old me was like. There is no career without that. <laughs> <laughs> there is. There is. It's been okay. Good for you, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy's gonna get it one of these one, days. One of these days. Hey, kiddo. A purple <laughs> dinosaur. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Away. Oh, yes, we got a couple now. Okay, why don't we start? I saw uh, your hand go up first. Okay. Um, so both of you did work on Ruby, right? And I was curious, in comparison to a lot of the vocalization stuff you do, how working for Rooster Teeth, since you're like the original actress, how that was different than like dubbing anime and stuff? Uh, I cried a lot from laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're a great team. They are a great team. Yeah. Um, it was very weird. I'd been uh, aware of the show and a fan of the show, and then I got a, um, a message um, on Twitter, direct message from Harry, um, which I thought was a joke. And uh, he said- it Seems to be some of the best things in our yeah, lives. Yeah, exactly. From that you know, joke email to And uh, he was like, hey, uh, I don't know if you're aware of our show, but we'd like to have you audition for something. And I was like, am I aware of your show? I'm a fan of your show. Uh, and so I auditioned for the role. Um, and it was very exciting. I mean, with anime, most of the series is in existence, so we can research and know kind of what's coming, or the director's gonna know what's coming. With uh, Ruby, I had no idea the plans that they had for Ilya. I had no idea if she was gonna be like one episode or if she was gonna hang around for a while. Um, and I just took it moment by moment. I wouldn't know until I got the scripts. And the sessions seemed to fly by. They never seemed like they were yeah. long enough, because we only did an episode, two episodes at a time, and we would do my lines, and then they'd say, cool, let's get some fighting reactions. Uh, maybe we can get some stuff that's like this. So I had no idea like what the fight scenes were gonna look like. I had no idea what was gonna happen for her. Uh, so the, when I'm watching the, um, the final episode, I'm experiencing it for the first time like you guys are. Whereas with anime, like we see it, the characters are, the, the animation is informing our performance as well as, as much as the uh, Japanese voice actor is, or whoever the original language is, they're all informing and giving us clues of what's gonna happen. Um, but like she said, uh, with that, it was just trusting the, the Rooster Teeth team. Of like, okay, cool, I'll give you some reactions. I hope you guys can do something with this. Mm -hmm. um, and then afterwards I'm like, wow. They did. You, you guys really went all out with those three reactions that you needed. <laughs> exactly what you needed. Okay. So yeah, they're fantastic. Uh, well, yeah. for me. Yeah, you. Okay. <laughs> well, for me, it's more of a question of is there a particular story, whether it's an anime or a game, that you're I really if they ever localize this, I want to be the voice actress for blank character. Rain and Fate Stay Night Anything are, like, I think we've been, I, I don't know about you, I've been pretty lucky enough yeah. to be in the ones that I 